Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you might be calling in from. Welcome to the webinar today, which is addressing the question, are we in this together? Or maybe uh, we're exploring, I guess we assume that we are in this together, but exploring how that we could do that better. I think we are in this together for two reasons, pragmatic and, and moral. I think uh, to borrow WHO's director's comments, no one is safe until everyone is safe. And I think that an equitable vaccine distribution is a moral imperative for us as well. So expert panel today will explore our progress in um, equitable and inclusive responses to COVID and explore how we can do this better. I'm Nathan Grills, I'm a public health physician at the University of Melbourne at the Population School of Population and Global Health. And our school is jointly hosting this session today with the um, Melbourne School of Population and Global Health Student Society and the Australian Global Health Alliance which is Australia's peak body for global health organisations and brings together respected global health experts around policy and technical areas to deepen collaboration between members. And a number of our, our speakers are from the Alliance as well. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that many of us are joining this call from traditional lands of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Uh, for myself, that's the lands of the Wundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders past, uh, present and future. Let me allow, I want, to, I want to introduce now the panel. Uh, it's a very expert panel. I haven't got time to go through all their extensive CVs. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing what each has to say. So firstly, to, to welcome Jane Holton. She is the chair of the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations. She's also the co-chair of uh, the COVAX Initiative and a member of uh, Australia's COVID-19 Coordination Commission Advisory Committee. But you would also know that previously she was also Secretary for Health and Secretary for Finance for the Australian Government and also President of the World Health Assembly and numerous other roles that Jane's played. So welcome, Jane. And to welcome uh, Professor Brendan Crabb, AC. He's the CEO and Director of the Burnham Institute and has been for a long time, since 2009, which I think when I worked there, he was, in 2009, he was the Director. Uh, he has, has extensive experience in international health and um, we, uh, we're looking forward to your comments, Brendan, around Australia's response, particularly. He's on a lot of expert committees, WHO, NHMRC, and, and you name it, he's on one of those committees. Uh, and to welcome Dr. Stephanie Williams. She's a public health physician and the Australian ambassador for the regional, for regional health security for the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade in Australia. Professor Annalise Wilder-Smith, she's a professor of emerging infectious diseases at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Uh, she's also the, uh, the focal person for WHO's um, SAGE Committee on COVID-19. So look forward to hearing more about uh, the response from WHO's level. And finally, to welcome Professor T. Jacob John. Uh, he's a celebrated pioneering virologist from CMC Valor. Uh, he's had over 480 publications and I've seen his name in Indian media most days uh, over the last, last year, uh, commenting on uh, the COVID-19 epidemic and response in India. He was a former director of, IC of the Indian Council for Medical Research's Centre for Advanced Virology Research. And he also was at the forefront of diagnosing and um, planning India's HIV response back in the 1980s. So it's an expert committee. I'm looking forward to hearing from each of them. Um, we're going to ask each of you a question or two, and uh, these will include questions that have been submitted from our audience. And the audience, you can post further questions in the Q&A function um, if you want, and we'll try and answer those during the course of the, the webinar. You can also join the conversation at Twitter uh, at, the, at Minimalb MSPGH. So I'll start with uh, Jane, if that's okay. And uh, Jane, you're the chair, the co-chair of the COVAX initiative. Um, and I think many of us have heard that term uh, used many times over the last uh, six months. Maybe not all of us know how it works. Um, firstly, just to ask you, why does vaccine equity matter? And why does well, COVAX exist? Um, and you know, how will it increase that, the, the vaccine coverage? So COVAX is actually a crucial initiative and it's a partnership, <clears throat> much like CEPI is actually as well. But it is genuinely a partnership of organisations who have come together um, at the initiative of um, CEPI and Gavi in the first instance, but then as a trilateral arrangement with WHO and now with our delivery partner in UNICEF, precisely because uh, as 
Tedros has said on a number of occasions, I think we've all said it in the media, uh, while we've got any one country that is still suffering from this disease, we've actually all still got it. And absent uh, really particular interventions, we know, because we have seen this in the past, that vaccines are pre-purchased and then snapped up by wealthy countries. And it is a sad reality of the over 2 billion doses already administered, 2.2. Oh, let's not, not be that specific. We don't really know, but say 2.2. Uh, we believe that somewhere between 76 and 70 percent, 7 percent of those doses have gone into the arms of people in precisely 10 countries. And absent intervention to both fundraise, but also to be part of that supply chain, that procurement process, um, there is every possibility, and we're now still struggling, and we can talk about this no doubt, with making sure that we deliver vaccines to the vulnerable around the world. And I won't recite the studies and the modelling that's been done to demonstrate that if you deliver vaccines in the first instance to people who are vulnerable first around the world, you significantly reduce the cost in human lives, and also, of course, in terms of people's more, lives more broadly, their social life, their economic life, etc. So COVAX was conceived of to actually try and work through the really big challenges in getting equity into delivery of these vaccines. Um, we've had some rocks on the road, but we have done a number of things which literally are world firsts. And it is literally then a partnership between research and development and manufacturing. So CEPI, its partners, including uh, industry, Industry. Uh, Gavi with its advanced purchase arrangements and its expertise in procuring vaccines principally for children around the world historically and then of course WHO with its focus on policy normative approaches and then UNICEF for its delivery um, elements but we we have probably one of the most vibrant and we do have um, the sort of uh, the social uh, side of this in terms of community-based organisations as part of our arrangements. So we literally are a collaboration, a collective, all of whom have the same objective, which is to deliver vaccines to people around the world where they need them. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great initiative with a great um, target. Uh, has COVAX been able to reach those targets? And the second, second part of that question which people have asked is, is what sort of level of coverage do we need to get to? Uh, to keep us safe as a, as, a, as a global community? Well, of course, this, this is a moving feast, isn't it? Um, when we started with the initiative, our objective was to vaccinate uh, probably about 20% of people around the world. We thought that would protect the most vulnerable. But we now know that the ambition and probably the need in terms of our targets is changing. And indeed, uh, I was on a, a COVAX meeting literally uh, two nights ago talking about exactly how this will vary depending on your, on your ambition. Uh, depending on the level of coverage you can and think you should deliver. So this has got a way to go. Our objective for this year has been to procure and deliver 2 billion doses, which would take us um, to about 23% coverage in the countries that we are talking about. Uh, we have had some hiccups on the delivery pathway, particularly given the crisis in India, where a lot of our early supplies were due to come from. Now, I actually have opened on the computer screen on my right-hand side um, a chart which actually shows me that we should still, and this is a combination of vaccines that we will hopefully procure. So these are commitments that have been made, but we did have commitments coming out of India. We have got commitments in terms of delivery, but also now um, with the assistance of uh, some donors, we still believe we're on track this year for about 1.9 billion doses of vaccine. But uh, I have learned during the course of this pandemic, as indeed has everybody else, uh, and, until it's secured in a country and going into people's arms, we don't want to overclaim, but we are hopeful we will get to that number. We also can see prospects of getting significantly above that uh, number into the first half of next year. Um, but this is literally a day by day proposition. It's been great to see G7 and the world community get behind COVAX. Uh, is there anything else that Australia could be doing to support COVAX? Well, certainly Australia um, has been a good partner. Um, we know that Australia has focused not just on our region, which of course is what it should do with its efforts in Timor-Leste and with efforts, for example, into Papua New Guinea and uh, uh, other parts of the Pacific. But Australia was an early sign-on to the COVAX initiative. I mean, one of the ways we were actually able to get this up and running was to offer an arrangement to countries to also participate in uh, collective procurement. And it's worth reminding ourselves that 
that when we started on the COVAX initiative, we did not know whether we would get any vaccine mm -hmm. against uh, this disease, let alone, of course, the, the numbers of vaccines we now have. And Australia was one of those high income countries who actually also signed on. So we, we as Australia have been a good partner as well. Um, we are party to those discussions. And uh, of course, I am hopeful that we will continue and we have made financial contributions to, for example, the advanced market commitment that's run by Gavi. Uh, that was pledged, uh, the, the recent pledge in the pledging conference that was held with Japan. So yes, we Australia are there. Now, can we do more? Of course, we can always do more and I will continue to advocate that. But yes, Australia is a good partner. Thank you, Jane. I might ask Annalise uh, Wilder-Smith a few questions, uh, particularly, I mean, you've heard, Annalise, you've heard uh, Jane's um, brief about COVAX. And I know that WHO is centrally involved in that and you're the point person for the strategic advisory group of experts on immunisation at WHO. And I know that um, you know, obviously for the last year, COVID has been your space. Um, so what else is WHO doing to try and increase equitable access to, to treatment and preventions, including vaccines? And why is that equitable access important? So there are two aspects of equi equitable access. So one is distribution uh, between countries and within countries. So for the equitable distribution between countries, so access to vaccines globally, COVAX is the main mechanism and it was well explained by Jane just now. But within countries, a WHO has developed a values framework um, that sets a foundation for a prior, prioritization roadmap. So that within countries, you get the maximum public health impact with the limited vaccine supplies that we have. And we now all know that the, the biggest public health impact is if you go to age de-escalation. So you go for the high risk groups uh, with the higher age groups, and then you go further down. Plus the ethical principle of reciprocity, which means you want to give back to, to those who are giving to the society. And that's mainly now the healthcare and social care workers so that they are, um, that they are affected, but there are also you no know, strata in the, in the, in the social uh, economical um, demographics for people, for individuals who cannot protect themselves, cannot do social distancing, um, either because uh, they are in a situation, a setting like migrants, refugees, uh, prisoners, or people you know in real abysmal poverty who just cannot do social <coughs> distancing, or others who have to continue, you know, to uh, you know, help the society to function and can therefore not do social distancing. And they also have an, 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 an higher right basically to, um, to the vaccine. But coming back to the, to the allocation, you know, uh, uh, between countries, COVAX remains, remains the mechanism. There is, uh, you know, there is a high buy-in from more than 190 countries. There is a strong political will, and there is critical mass of expertise draw, drawing from from Davide, Gavi, Sepi, UNICEF, etc. Um, so, so then your second question, the second question that you had is why is equitable distribution needed? <clears throat> well, there is a public health reason imperative, and as you said before, there is a moral imperative. The public health imperative is really, as we already said, and Jane reiterated, is as long as, long as there's still someone, <laughs> no one is safe. And that means not only for countries, but also individuals. So the, the aim of high vaccination rates is not only to protect lives, but also, as we know, the aim is also to reopen the economy. Now, to reopen the economy, an essential part is reopening our borders. So even if you achieve high vaccine coverage rates and, and now you want to open your borders, if the rest of the world has still high uh, circulation, you now have a high importation risk. And the point in case here was the UK. The United Kingdom was really the best country in Europe, where I live, in achieving very high vaccine coverage rates. But by history, the connection between UK and India is higher than compared to other countries in Europe. And prompt, it now has a Delta variant um, outbreak in the UK 
despite of high vaccination coverage rates. The other public health imperative, indeed, are these variants of concerns. We know that they evolve in settings of high virus transmission in the background of low vaccine coverage rates. And, and no hard-won gains that we've had with our very efficacious vaccines to date, and even if we achieve high vaccine coverage rates, may, there may be a setback if we then import vaccine um, variants that have that 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 can escape your vaccine. We can it can result in vaccine failures, although we have not seen that, but could happen in the future. But it will definitely result in a reduction of your vaccine effectiveness. Um, so, and then the other reason for equitable distribution is to protect vulnerable uh, countries. You know, some, you know, we can actually say that some of the high income countries had the highest burden of deaths and maybe in part were justified to go for, for, for you know, trying to secure the vaccines for themselves. But there are also vulnerable countries, even with a lower disease burden, where just the lockdown will put them over the edge to collapse. And we need economic collapse, social collapse. And so we need to protect vulnerable countries, even if their disease burden is currently lower. And as we've learned from India, but as we're now also seeing from Africa, even if the current <coughs> disease burden is lower, <laughs> they cannot predict the future and, 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 and as we've seen, the Indian crisis was, um, you know, came at a time when politicians, but maybe even scientists thought, oh, India now has enough herd immunity. And then, of course, there's this ethical Im imperative, all humans are equal, we should address all humans with respect and dignity, and all should have equal access to vaccines. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Annalise. You touched on some issues there around what the um, end game is as well in terms of uh, the global response to the pandemic, but I'll come back to that. I think if we get time, I think that's a whole uh, issue that may be opened up, I think, by Jacob as well. But I might go to Brendan Crabb. Uh, Brendan, you've seen the Burnett to having international focus now for the last uh, nine years, and you work largely in the Asia Pacific region, a number of partners here. Uh, how can Australia make a difference in supporting low and middle income countries, particularly in our region, I guess. Um, and is it just money or is it providing equipment and ventilators and PPE or what should the what should the Australian government be doing to better support those countries, those low and middle income countries, I guess, in our region? Uh, thanks for that, Nathan. And and thanks, Jane and Annalise, uh, for, for your comments already. Um, look, I the, the the most important and first thing for Australia to do is it isn't specific and it isn't related only to Australia. Um, you know, and, and I say what I say in the context of being, having been pretty positive about Australia's commitment. Jane mentioned one of the earlier, earlier contributors to COVAX that did some pretty bold things regionally, um, a $523 million commitment that, I, that I'm sure um, you'll hear about shortly to vaccines in the region. And then another $100 million through the the quad arrangement, and then direct, uh, we've heard at the G7 recently, um, another 20 million do um, doses of vaccines being contributed and so on. So they've really shown a consciousness of the issue and a willingness to do stuff in a way that I actually found pretty impressive and a little bit unexpected if that's un probably unfair of the officials involved. So it's that, it's that context. But, you know, the G7 a week or so ago, um, fanfare around a billion, do a billion dose commitment. I found quite disappointing. Um, and I don't know if I'm out of line there, uh, you know, that, that this was a special moment to, to demonstrate that um, we needed to really lift our game. You know, this was a Marshall Plan moment or something uh, extraordinary. Uh, and, and as an international rich country community, we fluffed it basically. Now, Australia's not a member of the G7, but I would like us to be doing our bit to lead that narrative. Why is it so important? I mean, I, I find rich countries in a strange headspace where, where we can't even do what's in our naked self-interest to do if it involves helping other people, anything like to the degree that we should. Um, and this is so much in our naked self-interest. 
obviously from a health perspective, this has been so well outlined already, um, but also economically, you know, um, and, and there are different calculations from whether it's the IMF or World Bank, but, you know, we're talking about trillion dollars to the, to the rich country's economy if, um, if, if we get this right. So I find us in a strange headspace globally in rich countries, and we have a real, um, we have influence. Australia has real influence. Um, we're not one of the G7, but, um, you know, along with, uh, with Canada and Japan and others, we can influence. And I would like to see that stepped up. We've, we've put some really good runs on the board. Could we um, take both the narrative and our financial commitment to the next level to try to lead and influence others? So that's the first thing. Um, I'm pretty impressed, as I said, with what we've done regionally in a bilateral and, and, and more regional uh, way, and you'll hear more about that from Stephanie, uh, I'm sure. I, I'm, what I'm looking for in that regional commitment and and uh, in in through COVAX as well is, you know, how many vaccines get into people's arms uh, as much as as how many we, we deliver. And I know that's a common cliche, but we really do have to look at that um, because what that means is we get systems in place to deliver them, which of course we all know on this call um, how, how important that is as much as as buying and delivering the vaccine. I think we've got room to move in Australia on our commitment to the ACT Accelerator. And of course, COVAX is a part of that. We've got significant room to move in COVAX, but we've got a lot of uplift we could do in Australia for the non-vaccine components as well, the diagnostics, the drugs and the health systems part of it that are going to all work together. Um, so I think that that's still a piece that we can work on in Australia while, while our regional commitments are, are so strong. And um, I think finally, I would say that our, our, and it's related to that, is a narrative needs to be not totally vaccine centric. And even when our vac we are vaccine centric, it's the public health response that goes, that goes with it. Um, and, and it'd be terrific to stress that. You know, I spent a lot of time in PNG and, and pretty clearly the, the sort of um, uh, logistical and vaccine hesitancy issues are, are so crucial and they're interrelated to a, a very weak health system in general and public health system that impacts so many ways on the outcome here. So, you know, I give uh, Australia really strong um, uh, marks and, uh, and, and, but just in that, in that more broader context, you know, a billion doses is not going to cut it. It's going to be, have to be four or five billion and it's going to have to be much faster uh, than, than the current timetable. And I don't see that level of desperation. I don't see the national press conferences around that. But the point of it's not over for us until it's over for them is, is actually really true. Uh, it's really true. So if we let the virus you know, out of control in the developing world, Australia is going to pay a big price, um, as well as, of course, being a moral uh, imperative has been, has been already said. Thank you, Brendan. I know that the Burnett Institute is a big part of that response, especially in our Asia Pacific region. Uh, beyond just the, not just the vaccine itself, but it's within the health system and the other technology required. So, uh, Steph, I might, Stephanie Williams, I might come to you and get your response on that. You're the Australian Ambassador for Regional Health Security uh, at DFAT. And I guess you've heard Brennan's overview of what um, the Australian government is doing and could do. Uh, what type of support is the Australian government currently providing uh, in the Indo-Pacific area to help the response to COVID? I mean, we've heard about the actual vaccines being given, I guess, but what other support is, is the Australian government providing currently? Thanks, Nathan. Um, and Brendan's done me a great favour because one of the things one is, has to do at the first point on the vaccine support is list the figures of financial support to give you an overview, um, which he's done for me, but I will do again. I'll take it in three parts. I will talk a little bit about the vaccine support on the backdrop of a bi bilateral COVID health response um, over the last 18 months on the backdrop of an existing partnership in health systems in the region but I'll keep to your time, I promise. So, I mean, I remember the first chatter about vaccine um, as a tool to respond to COVID from about February, 2020. And I'm, I'm in the group of people that thought, ah, oh, this is not a 2020 problem. This has got to be a 2021 programming problem. And I'm pleased to have been wrong on that matter because by the end of October, the government had 
committed uh, early commitment to the advanced market commitment that James talked about for the COVAX facility, um, um, which was $80 million, and then another $50 million at the replenishment um, a couple of months ago, taking Australia's multilateral contribution to $130 million, recognising that this was a multi essential um, and new part of the multilateral architecture and, we're architecture, and we're really pleased to have seen um, more than half a million doses in our region and in Southeast Asia, much more than that delivered by COVAX, notwithstanding its challenges. Um, then by the 31st of October, the government had announced $523 million in the regional vaccine access health, um, and health security initiative with really two goals buy more doses for the Indo-Pacific region and deliver and, and enable end-to-end -end support on the systems required to um, either deliver mass campaigns or incorporate adult immunisation into countries which have never um, systematically had to immunise adults. And that's across 18 countries in the Indo-Pacific. Um, and as at today, there is um, on that delivery support, that system support, we're working largely through the multilateral partners, through UNICEF, through NGOs like the Burnett as well in many places, to on things like risk communication, demand generation, cold chain infrastructure, health information systems. That support has been really tailored to country needs and is in train. And then the delivering doses part, um, there's, there's a direct dose sharing agreement through AstraZeneca that we're manufacturing in Australia. And I know it doesn't sound very much, but we've been very pleased to be able to send over 350,000 doses directly to the region, which means as at today, Fiji has been able to immunise first dose coverage of more than 40% of their population during um, their current outbreak of COVID. And we um, are working with government to expand the access to direct dose supply. And of course, that's related to the 20 million dose donation. Um, and that's a small but really important part of continual supply in our region to countries that need it. And then, of course, there's a regional UNICEF Australia partnership where we're, again, aiming to supplement and complement the COVAX 2021 deliveries through additional dose purchase. When I say all that, I think about the announcement on that, and I, again, I was, um, you know, pleased to hear Brendan's being surprised by it was a it was a risky gamble. We were announcing this, and it was at the time at the time where rich countries had APAs, but this was three months before WHO had issued its first EUL for a COVID vaccine, and and I think it was partly as well recognising there was a regional opportunity for Australia that we had a foundation um, to step up from and that foundation being very briefly, because I know you're watching the time, um, our, pivot, our COVID pivot response from last year, which was the whole aid program um, with a health focus, but also an economic social support um, pivot to countries COVID responses um, had done in 2020. And when I think about the health part of that, you know, we, we joined partners in the, um, the scramble to, for material supply, for system support, for planning support for COVID. But in the Pacific in particular, and in some parts of Southeast Asia, that was possible because Australia has been a long-standing bilateral partner in health in so many of these countries. So, and I'll just, I'll end there by really trying to step back the current flagship vaccines on top of a COVID response, which was enabled by actually a pre-existing commitment to universal health coverage and health security in the region. I'll stop there. Thank, thank you, Steph. Uh, that, that's amazing, the coverage in Fiji of AstraZeneca. Um, can I ask a particular question about AstraZeneca that's been asked by the audience? Should Australia be donating AstraZeneca to COVAX and to the Pacific Islands if it might be taken by young adults who we, in Australia we don't advise to receive it because of the risk of, of uh, side effects from AstraZeneca? So countries' use of vaccines that have received WHO, EUL and approval by stringent regulatory authorities are sovereign decisions. In Australia's direct donation of AstraZeneca, we have been very clear at every moment um, on ATAGI advice. So on the Thursday, the 8th of April, the date is seared on um, my mind, at least, that first announcement of the um, syndromes and the change in eligibility. The first thing Australia does is transmit that advice through our posts. 
encourage a discussion and dialogue with government. And we've had several um, bilateral engagements with our Atagi reps and our ministry counterparts to understand the decision and the thinking. And that again with the advice from last week too. And countries have been very clear in some of their early decisions about risk benefit in their own setting, which WHO certainly supports. And I note Fiji's statement over the weekend about their commitment to continue using AstraZeneca given their situation. So it's absolutely not, uh, it's absolutely a sovereign country decision on risk and benefit of that technology. And, and in offering AstraZeneca CSL, we are very, um, we're also always available for that exchange and technical discussion between experts should there be a need for further information. Thanks, Steph. And I think some of us in Australia think that Australia probably should be more, uh, more favourable to AstraZeneca as well, but that's another discussion. Uh, Jacob, I might come to you, Professor T. Jacob John. He's from um, CMC of Law, as I mentioned. You have been at the forefront of the uh, post pulse polio vaccination in India. Uh, one thing about the pulse polio vaccination in India was it was very equitable. Um, people who are poor, people who are rich, people who are urban, rural, high caste, low caste, everyone has had access to an extremely effective um, program across India. In relation to COVID vaccines in India, how can India make sure that its poorer communities have access to vaccinations? How can we ensure that it's available at all different levels? Now, Jacob, you might be on mute. Yep, that's right. All right, yeah. Um, the equitable distribution of polio vaccine was because of the eradication goal. Um, so I'll come back to that later on. Uh, as far as the uh, COVID vaccines are concerned, I have good news and bad news. So let me give you good news first. Yesterday, one day, 8.596 million people were vaccinated across the country. Uh, that is 21st of June. And uh, that uh, was the beginning of a new government policy to provide vaccine to everybody, particularly rural people, the vulnerable, the uneducated. Uh, till 20th of June, part of the bad news, vaccine, you had to book an appointment on a smartphone with an app called COVIN. And then you get uh, an appointment in a particular place. You go there. And if you're lucky, everything is OK. If you're unlucky, by the time you reach there, they ran out of stock. So you have to rebook your appointment. And so hiccups were there. Um, the month of June, Government of India has uh, 120 million doses available to the Government of India. Previously, uh, the average number of doses available was about 70 million. And, uh, you know, considering the population of India as 1,400 million, and if you want to give two doses per head, you can I can understand that uh, there was a miscalculation or let me be honest, the very popular present government has a certain a political uh, sociological ideology which is uh, with an ambivalence between science and pseudoscience. Um, therefore, I believe no planning was done for vaccine procurement until the 3rd or 4th of January when private companies applied to the regulatory agency and got approval for emergency use authorization to the government authorizing them that you can use the vaccine under uh, that uh, regulation, emergency use. Then 
the government of India ordered vaccine. And so the, the start was extremely slow. And then the uh, available vaccine, then more vaccine was donated, gifted, or sold to other countries than we had for use in the country in the beginning, January, February, and early March. Um, the first recommendation was to, following the WHO uh, guidance for a certain extent, healthcare workers first, then everyone above 65, then everyone above 45, then everyone above 18. So the current policy is to open up to everyone above 18. And under that uh, policy, yesterday it was opened up as a, you don't have to book uh, anything. You, you don't have to apply, you don't have to uh, uh, have a smartphone. Uh, rural areas, urban centers, they will announce where vaccines are available. And you just go there, stand in the queue, and get vaccinated. Um, so that is how 8.596 million people were covered yesterday. Now, India has a reputation of being a pharmacy of the world. Uh, we have the production capacities uh, for millions and billions of doses. As I said first, there was no plan, expectation of vaccine as a tool against this pandemic for a very long time in 2020. That set us back from the potential of playing the vaccine pharmacy of the world to, uh, to take a back seat. So two private companies, one AstraZeneca or Oxford University approached one company and said, can you manufacture this vaccine? And they had uh, an agreement. So that took off. The other one was an Indian company, not a university uh, type research, no tie up with the university. They just uh, were manufacturing huge amounts of different vaccines. They were famous for the conjugated typhoid vaccine, uh, Japanese encephalitis vaccine, uh, and so forth. So they came to the uh, conclusion early in 2020 that they want to make the vaccine against COVID. So they tied up with Indian Council of Medical Research, got a virus strain. Their approach was to inactivate. Uh, they happened to have a BSL-3 manufacturing unit. Nothing to do with COVID. It was pre-COVID that they had made it uh, ostensibly for the safety of the staff from any infection of any microbe that they handle to make viruses. Uh, so they uh, created the vaccine. They got a novel adjuvant, al quim, which is a TH1 and TH2 promoting uh, adjuvant, a unique adjuvant. Um, and so they began phase one trial, phase two trial, and only after phase two trial was completed were they given permission for phase three trial. That was in September of 2020. A lot of delay happened because there was no vision for, unlike UK had a, a task force for vaccine development way back in February or March of 2020, government funded. Uh, we didn't have any of uh, those kind of mechanisms. So by the time the private companies got approval or uh, emergency use authorization was January of 2021. And then the government ordered whatever vaccine was on the shelf and then asked them to manufacture more vaccine. So that was, uh, that was the delay in uh, scaling up vaccine production. 
now the companies are uh, uh, scaling up very, very effectively that's how 120 million doses are available in the month of june and it will keep escalating the third vaccine has entered the market which is this sputnik v from russia it is russian manufactured vaccine imported but indian companies will begin manufacturing that mm. so the future looks very good mm. that there yes. will be enough vaccines to supply uh, even the poorest of the poor countries mm. but it will take a little time uh, india's mm. need itself is so huge uh, that i think there will be a balance between these two in country use and uh, gifting to covax i think india is uh, signed up with covax to help covax so yeah future seems to be a good slow start and thanks jacob uh, that's amazing you can vaccinate 9 million people in a day i think we could do australia in about three days which we, we're very jealous of uh, and I, we've had the same issues here in terms of our booking systems and it's not just uh, an issue you're having over there. Uh, Jacob, um, I might come back, we might just open it up to the other panellists now, if you have any other comments on what's been said so far. Uh, I know that both Annalise and yourself, also Jacob, were interested in talking about what's the, what's the end point for all this? What's the objective we should be aiming for? Is it eradication? That's probably the most equitable outcome, but is that achievable? Um, that might be something you want to comment on. Um, another panelist might want to come in and comment on as well. So, Jacob, maybe in a very short uh, yeah. uh, summary of what you think me, could be possible. Me first, okay. Um, having heard all the panelists uh, ask a question, we are in it together. There's no doubt about that. Uh, what do we want? We want uh, my country fully vaccinated. All other countries fully vaccinated because if other countries are not vaccinated, what happened in UK can happen anywhere, anytime. So we need to, to vaccinate everybody. So other countries getting vaccinated is in my interest, in my country's interest. So we want that. We want uh, to preempt emergence of nasty variants. So we need to you know, reduce uh, transmission everywhere. Mm. We want vaccine equity. We want global cooperation. We want WHO leadership uh, as the premier public health agency of the world. All these can be packaged into one goal, goal of eradication of COVID. Okay, so I'm a strong advocate of uh, the eradication goal. I'm not going to, I'm not saying that do it tomorrow. I'm saying that planning should start now. There is a journal called the Christian Journal of Global Health. In November 2020, I wrote uh, a paper which says, time to begin plans for COVID eradication is now. Time to begin planning so that the thought process will uh, begin. You don't, everything on paper, no money uh, involved at all. Uh, just this month, June of 2021, there's another paper in Indian Pediatrics, COVID-19 eradication for vaccine equity in low-income countries. The best way to achieve vaccine equity, the poorest of the poor countries and every community guaranteed access to vaccine is only when we have a goal of eradication. Jacob, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, I'm not sure if any other panelists want to comment on on that as an end game. And um, after that, we'll open it up for other questions from the audience. But any other, any other comments from the panel? I'm happy to have a go. I see Stephanie too. Sorry. Uh, look, I I support that. Um, I don't publicly state it very often because I I. Uh, um, it's a controversial thing to say, basically get laughed at in this country. Mm. But, um, but I think it should be our stated goal, but not the, you know, the medium term end game. You know, it's not, we're not going to eradicate it from every country in the world before we start functioning um, again more normally. So I think we can have intermediate steps, but I would like us to see the end game of uh, COVID at the moment as um, 
as a global elimination, you know, whether we, we really are talking about every, every virus um, uh, particle from the world um, uh, gone or not, but, but an elimination uh, strategy is what drives equity and it may actually be needed. You know, we love to say, well, what we've got to do is reduce COVID um, from a serious illness to a min minor cold. And of course, uh, if we could do that for every person in the world, that would be okay. We don't actually know we can do that. Um, we might be able to do it, but of course, as everyone on this call knows, COVID isn't a cold, even when it's, it's, uh, it, it's relatively mild. Um, we also know that we're driving mutants all, all the time, as Jacob said. Um, so, so I like that as a, as a more than aspirational, as a, as a real target, and the way that we talk about measles in that way. Um, you know, we're obviously talking very seriously about polio in that way, but we are talking about measles in that way too, and regional regions try to eliminate measles. And, and um, you know, I think that's a tougher job than what this will be, given the quality of the vaccines and how well public health interventions intervene because it's a less transmissible um, in infection. So I think that that's, that's um, an end, you know, a really important goal. And one of the questions in the chat relates to, you know, well, how high a vaccine coverage we're going to need in Australia, um, just taking Australia as an example to be safe. Um, it depends a lot on what's happening in the rest of the world. And, uh, and of course, the only thing that's really going to make Australia safe is very, very low levels of virus around the world. Um, of course, we need high vaccine coverage but that's not going to be um, enough for us. Thank you, Brendan. Uh, Stephanie, do you want to comment as well? Um, yeah, and it's a personal view. Um, and it's, 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 it's interesting to hear that um, thinking and planning now for eradication. And I just can't help but reflect on how that drives us as a global health community in our constant chasing of single disease eradication pathways. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but I, you know, the polio goal was set in 1980. We thought it would take 12 years. The tail has been 20 plus years. It is an investment that, in a way, the world has staked our capacity for eradication on the polio initiative. And, um, and I think we should be learning from that as we go and plan about elimination or broad goals for other diseases, because we, yeah, I, I just, I was just interested in the reflection on ambition and then um, what our track record is as a world on polio to inform how we think about COVID. But I'll stop. And, I, and I might make a comment too, if I might. I mean, I, I think it's laudable. I think the challenge, we've just talked about access and equity. I think the challenge is if you suck up what is not an infinite bucket of resources, chasing um, this particular goal, the question I have is at what cost? Um, what is the opportunity cost we have in terms of other things that we neglect? Now, if we had infinite resources, I would be enormously supportive. I just, I just worry that when we come to pragmatic allocation of resources, and we've seen this issue when we've you know gone very single-mindedly in the global context after a particular issue that sometimes there is then a desert of resources looking at some of the other things so um, I think it's laudable and I think the thinking which enables you then to drive equity across vulnerable populations across geographies across you know regardless of politics people who are in need that I wholeheartedly support um, I do worry that our experience um, uh, of these things elsewhere suggests that it may be extraordinarily resource intensive and therefore I do worry about the, the other consequences. Thanks, may I add um, that indeed at WHO next week there is a SAGE, extraordinary SAGE meeting dedicated to thinking through the, vac the global vaccine strategies for 2022 and beyond. And indeed, it, it is driven, the strategies are first driven by a, by a public health objective. And the current objective, as you all know, is just to reduce deaths and protect healthcare workers. Uh, and the next then is to reduce disease burden and, and protect healthcare systems. But the ultimate goal is then to reduce virus transmission. Now the vaccine, your goal will determine the strategy. If, if your goal is, you know, a redu is, trans is, is reduction of transmission 
um, and elimination and eradication, it you need incredibly high vaccine coverage rates. And you also need to extend the age indication to very down to, to, to children. And some countries may not buy into this because they have other you know, priorities. And, and therefore, uh, we now need to come globally to a consensus, you know, what are the incremental benefits in terms of you really need to invest a lot more to get the vaccine coverage rates, knowing that there's lots of vaccine hesitancy as well, plus getting to the last person in the remote area is extremely expensive, we know it from polio. So we really need to think through this early on so that we are coming together with realistic goals. And, and WHO will publish uh, in the next weeks or months, uh, you know, the, the vaccine coverage rates depending on those goals. Mm. Uh, thanks, Elise. That's fascinating to hear that perspective from WHO. I might, uh, I might throw to Abby Minta, who's the Deputy Director of the Australian Global Health Alliance, and also Zainab Karashi, uh, the President of the Melbourne Population Global Health Student Society. Uh, they've been curating the questions from the audience. So uh, maybe you could pose a couple of the questions um, from the audience, if that's okay. Hi Nathan, thanks. Um, I've got a question for you, Jane, from the audience. Um, so in the Lancet this week, it described how COVAX has fallen far short of its goals. Of the, 20, of the 2 billion um, vaccine doses that's been administered, administered worldwide so far, COVAX has only been responsible for less than 4%. How can vaccine equity be achieved without governments around the world placing much greater pressure on pharmaceutical companies to ensure that um, patents are waived, so i.e. the TRIPS waiver, and technology transfer started. Jane, That's the t-shirt of the pandemic, you're on mute, I think. Um, we should all have one, so apologies. Look, that's a really complicated question, and let me start by saying, yes, we would love to have delivered more vaccines by now. And as I indicated in my earlier remarks, we're hopeful of getting to close to our 2 billion target, which was the target we set for this year towards the end of the year. Um, are we satisfied that that is adequate? No, of course we aren't. Mm -hmm. And as I already said, there are a number of things that we've done with COVAX, including, for example, the creation of a world first um, indemnity and liability arrangement in relation to these vaccines, which um, it, it sounds so easy when you say it, but to deliver it is unbelievably difficult. The question though of TRIPS waivers that you uh, pose is I think alluring but as I have said now on many occasions, my view is it's a necessary but not a sufficient condition to actually scale up production. And one of the things that CEPI is doing, we actually have a manufacturing working group um, that we have uh, created working with our other partners in COVAX, but we are leading this working group, including with industry. And so I think we need to remember that that what it takes to scale up production is many, many, many things. Access to intellectual property is absolutely one of them. But frankly, if we don't get technology transfer, if we haven't secured access to all the relevant materials, raw materials, access to, um, you know, it, it, all the things that you need for bioreactors, I could just go on and on and on and on with the list. Well, then clearly uh, you're not going to produce the thing that you're all um, aiming for, which is additional vaccines. So the reason we've set up this working group is to try and work our way through. And to be honest with you, um, we decided that we would not wait for the discussion about TRIPS because many of us have been here before and we know <laughs> that this will take hours and months and an awful lot of um, uh, furrowed brows and late nights and may or may not deliver. So our view was, can we, with our partnerships, scale up manufacturing, including through tech transfer, um, including tech transfer in relation to mRNA, whilst that other discussion is going on? So, yes, we want to do better. Yes, we should find fairer and more equitable ways, including broader geographic distribution of manufacturing. But I'm a big fan of what can I do now? What can I deliver now whilst waiting for the, the grand statements of principle and inked agreements? So um, we've got a lot more work to do, but the good news is the partnership is absolutely determined. All of our partners are really, really working hard. So um, I'm hopeful. I said this at the outset. I don't want to overpromise, but I am hopeful that uh, you're going to see a significant ramp up in vaccine delivery, which is what we all want.
Awesome, thank you. I'll just handle it to Abby now. Thanks, Zainab. So I've got a question for Jacob. Across the world, poverty, inequity and chronic disease has exacerbated throughout this pandemic. How can we rectify this as we recover and build back? Well, that's also a complicated question, but I will choose uh, bits and pieces to answer. First of all, the synonym of public health is equity. So if you want equity, you need a public health uh, thinking. Do we want the virus to dictate its terms to us or do we want to dictate our terms to the virus? That is the critical question. Do we just respond to what the virus is doing all over the world or do we take matters in our hand and address the issue, catch the bull by its horns? The one disease agenda the virus has given to us. Right now, everybody is concerned with one disease. All other diseases are being neglected. We cannot keep on living with that, that burden. We have tuberculosis and polio eradication, so many other things. On polio eradication, let me uh, open up the possibility that that's precisely what you need for COVID eradication. The same platform, same methodology, 99% of the infections are asymptomatic. You need to follow community transmission. You have the tools, you have the vaccines, you have diagnostic tools. We have even sewage surveillance for, so polio eradication platform can be used for COVID eradication. Um, vaccine supply chains uh, and so forth. The expenses, every country wants to control COVID. What is eradication or elimination? Extreme control. So we have already started the journey in every country. What is the end point that each country can aspire for, eliminate in your own country. So a lot of expenses would come from within countries. Um, coverages. I have three points of urgency of eradication, setting a goal of eradication. First is, we know that uh, Mostelide, Felide, Canada, Cervide families of animals are susceptible to infection, and a couple of them highly susceptible to enzootic infection, transmitting it between them. We don't want a new reservoir developing somewhere and vitiating the atmosphere so that an eradicable one today becomes non-eradicable tomorrow. That is urgency number one. Urgency number two is that uh, the community immunity is the highest at this time. So you don't need to vaccinate everybody. You can strategize your vaccination to top up the herd immunity level and so we will take minimum vaccines if you do it now, in the next one, two, three, four, five years, than if we ever plan to eradicate it because of the big problems that we will have annually, high death rate, pregnant women, uh, diabetics, cancer treatment, organ transplant, hypertension, chronic heart disease, chronic lung disease, chronic kidney disease, all those uh, uh, fears, anxieties, and mortalities will continue year after year after year. So, uh, willy nilly, we'll be sending a whole lot of effort on this one infection, one disease. So, that is my uh, second urgency. Third urgency is that if you push now, the whole world will be supportive because everybody is fed up of the COVID. 
so if you say there is a way out so it's an aspirational goal to begin with it is to continue the journey that all countries are starting with it is for vaccine equity it is for using the polio platform more effectively in that process polio will get eradicated i'll stop here thank you thank you jacob um and i really like your comment about the synonym of public health is equity uh, and thank you each of the speakers for giving up your time today it's very clear we all know that we are all this together and it's great to have perspectives from all over the world today from from india from geneva from across australia um, so we thank you for your your sharing your time sharing your time today and your ideas with us um, i'd like to really thank all the guests that have come on the call as well we haven't been able to answer all your questions um, but all of us we are in this together and most of the people in this audience are also involved in the response to COVID, um, both in Australia and outside Australia as well. I'm sure if we're face to face, you'd like to show your appreciation for, uh, for the discussion and for the panelists. Um, but we can, the YouTube clip will be available, uh, which you can share and, and like and show your appreciation that way. Um, but also want to thank finally the partners as well that have put this uh, program together today, the Global Health Alliance, the Melbourne School of Population Global Health and the Student Society. And uh, we, we look forward to the next uh, webinar, which will be um, at some point in the coming, coming months for the um, global Melbourne School of Population and Global Health. But thank you again and take care. Thank you.